Hello, this is Dr. Gomez from UT Health San Antonio, and today we're going to see 100 cases. Rapid fire is just uh, with the intent of residents about to take the core exam uh, can get better at pattern recognition. Just looking at an image and trying to come up with the diagnosis as fast as possible, and then perhaps one to three important points of each case. First case, we have an AP view of a skeletally immature patient, and we see that there is widening of the proximal femoral growth plate on the right side as compared to the left side. And there is also minimal slippage, so the femoral neck is going superior in relation to the femoral head, which is still articulating with the acetabulum. So what we have here is a little bit of widening of the growth plate with some slippage of the femoral neck with respect to the femoral head. Follow-up examination shows progressive slippage of the femoral neck with respect to the femoral head and persistent widening of the growth plate. So this is a case of slip, capital femoral epiphysis, and it's a sort of type 1 Salter Harris injury to the growth plate because of microtrauma. It happens in adolescents, usually overweight, and it can be bilateral 20% of the time. The treatment is to pin the femoral neck and head as it is. You don't reduce it to then pin it because of the increased risk of avascular necrosis. Second case, we have AP and lateral views of the right knee, and there is a fairly large loosened lesion within the distal femur, mostly at the medial aspect of the distal femur, including the medial femoral condyle and distal medial femoral metaphysis. And this lesion has pretty much well-defined borders, but they are not sclerotic, and it's abutting the epiphysis. There appears to be some thinning of the cortex, but no cortical breakthrough. This is a giant cell tumor, and usually we mention this in the differential diagnosis of loosened lesions at the epiphysis. So this lesion is abutting the epiphysis. The other lesions you should remember is chondroblastoma, where we usually see that when the growth plate is still open and there is always EG lymphoma and infection. So giant cell tumor, well-defined lesion at the epiphysis that has well-defined non-sclerotic borders and is abode in the epiphysis. Third case, we have views of the little finger and there is a loosened lesion within the base of the proximal phalanx here. And this lesion is slightly expansile and it appears to have endosteal scallopings or thinning of the inner aspect of the cortex and also some regions of small matrix which appears to be chondroid. This is a case of an enchondroma and for the boards any loosened lesion that is slightly expansile in the hand you should think of enchondroma first. You don't need to see chondroid matrix but when you see it it actually helps in the diagnosis. The lesion uh, weakens the bone and it may be associated to a pathological fracture. Fourth case, we have AP and lateral views of the right humerus and there is an obvious large destructive lucent lesion within the proximal humerus with a wide zone of transition at the mid-humeral diaphysis. This is a very destructive and aggressive lesion because of the cortical breakthrough and extension into the soft tissues. Because this patient is an adult, every time you see an aggressive lytic lesion, you have to think of two things, myeloma versus metastasis. This was the only lesion seen on this patient, so it was a plasma cytoma. But those are the two main differential diagnoses of any lytic tumor in the adult patient, myeloma versus lytic metastasis. Case number five, we have AP and lateral view, so the right proximal humerus, and we see that there is a lesion, osseous lesion that is arising from the proximal humeral diametaphysis, and there is continuation of the medullary cavity into this osseous lesion, and when you hear that term, you need to think of an osteochondroma. However, there is a large lucent component to the tip of this osteochondroma that has some matrix, some, some calcification, and this matrix is chondroid. We immediately have to think that this osteochondroma has degenerated into a chondrosarcoma due to the large uh, component at the tip of the osteochondroma and the chondroid matrix. All right, MRI in T2, T1, post and sagittal CT scan 
show very clearly the osteochondroma here and we have all this region here that is the cartilaginous cap that has enlarged and now has all this chondroid matrix uh, consistent with the generation to a chondrosarcoma. We can see in the post contrast images that there is some central and peripheral enhancement of this lesion as well as in the surrounding soft tissues and we see the classic really high T2 signal intensity of the chondroid uh, component of the lesion. So the generated osteochondroma into a chondrosarcoma, remember to always keep an eye on that cartilaginous cap. Here we have MRI images of the leg on T1, T2, T1 with fat suppression and post catalinian and coronal T1. And we see that there is a fairly well-defined lesion with intermediate to high uh, T1 signal intensity, high T2 signal intensity, specifically centrally, peripheral enhancement with central necrosis on the post-contrast images. And we see that it's oval shaped. So first thing that we, uh, we can tell about this lesion is that it is in a location that is very important. It is in the location of the peroneal neurovascular bundle. So we have to think about nerve sheet tumors. And we see in the coronal image that there is split fat sign. And that is because nerves in the neurovascular bundle are surrounded by fat. And when the nerve gets growth because of a tumor, it splits the fat in the bundle. Also, there is the target sign because of central necrosis and which gives us this really, really central high T2 weight signal intensity. So this is a patient with neurofibromatosis and a nerve sheet tumor. And remember, uh, going in the location of a neurovascular bundle, split fat sign because of the neurovascular fat and the target sign. So we have AP radiographs of the shoulder and we see that this uh, single view of the shoulder is fixed in internal rotation so the humerus looks like a light bulb because of the internal rotation and whenever you have a shoulder radiograph with the humerus fixed in internal rotation you have to think about posterior dislocation and recommend an axillary view we can also see this fracture fragment here uh, in the, which projects within the inferior aspect of the glenohumeral joint and axillary recess. And we also have this continuity here of the greater and lesser tuberosity, kind of at the region of the intertubercular groove. So here we have confirmation with the axillary view. Remember that the acrimen is anterior, so to get oriented. And we have the glenoid and humeral head are not congruent. And we also have a fracture of the lesser tuberosity. So remember, uh, posterior dislocation, only 5% of the glenohumeral dislocation, usually a direct blow and associated to seizures, uh, which is usually asked on the test and the throw sign and fixed light bulb appearance of the humerus is uh, classic findings that we see. And when you get that finding on an AP radiograph, you have to uh, recommend an axillary view. So we have AP uh, views of the left shoulder in internal and external rotation and in a skeletally immature patient and we see a bubbly uh, loosened lesion within the proximal humerus and there is cortical disruption laterally consistent with a fracture so there's a pathological fracture in an unicameral bone cyst which are very common in the proximal humerus especially in, in the skeletally immature is a benign lesion and can have some endosteal scalloping and usually looks bubbly because of the septations. So in terms of the fracture, there are two signs with the same sign, but called different ways. So the trapdoor sign, so you have a piece of cortex that fractures and kind of hinges inside the cyst. And that's the trapdoor fracture sign. And also if the, if the fracture fragment falls in the dependent aspect of the cyst, we call it a fallen fracture fragment sign. So unicameral bone cyst with pathological fracture. So we have AP views of the chest in a pediatric patient and the pelvis, and we see that there is diffuse chlorosis of all the bones, the ribs, the proximal humeri, proximal femur, pelvic bones. And this increased chlorosis is very marked in a way that we see under tubulation. There is no medullary cavity, and this is a case of osteopetrosis. And osteopetrosis has the lethal infantile form and the adult form. It's the marble bone disease. And these bones, even though they look chlorotic, are actually weaker and are more prone to fracture. And this is the differential diagnosis of diffuse osteosclerosis. But just keep in mind that when you don't see a, med a medullary cavity, uh, that is very classic of osteopetrosis because the osteoclastic failure, the osteoclasts do not resorb bone and you get all that sclerosis within the medullary cavity.
here we have three views of the thumb. So every time you see radiographs of the thumb, you got to think about gamekeeper's thumb. And here is an osseous gamekeeper thumbs, and because there is a fracture at the base of the thumb proximal phalangeal at the ulnar side. And this is because there is avulsion of the ulnar collateral ligament, and there is an osseous fracture. However, you can have disruption of the ulnar collateral ligament without any osseous abnormality, and the radiograph may be negative. And in that case, you do an MRI, and what you're looking for in the MRI is to make sure the integrity of the UCL is normal, but also if it's torn, you want to make sure that the aponeurosis of the adductor pollicis is not interposed between the ligament and the bone, um, because if that happens, uh, it's called a stenner lesion, and the surgeon needs to know that, so he removes that aponeurosis out of the way so he can reduce the ulnar collateral ligament. Again, standard lesion, and the sign that we see in MRI is called a yo-yo in a string. Here we have a patient with uh, multiple body trauma, and we can see that there is uh, dislocation or diastasis of the left sacroiliac joint, some fracture here of the pelvis, fracture of the acetabulum, and dislocation of the symphysis pubis, as well as fracture of the contralateral inferior pubic ramus. So this is an unstable pelvic fracture that we call malgain, so it's a vertical shear fracture, so the vector forces go vertical, and this is this used to be a frequent flyer in the oral boards because this is highly associated to vascular injury and bladder injury as well as ureteral injury, and you would have to do a CTA and also a CT urogram, but we do all that nowadays when the patient comes in, but something to keep in mind because the high association to other injuries. So we have two views of a hand in a pediatric patient, and it seems like it's a little bit osteopenic, uh, but I just want you to pay attention to the distal metaphysis of the radius and ulna, where you have splaying, copping, and irregularity. This is very characteristic of rickets, uh, which is related to vitamin D deficiency. And in kids, it affects the growth plate and the metaphysis. In adults, we call it osteomyelitis and it's related to abnormalities in bone mineralization. So whenever you see a a fraying, splaying, and copying of the metaphysis, usually in the long bones, think about rickets, and which is related to deficiencies in vitamin D. Okay, so here we have a lateral view of the skull and a PA view of the hand, and we see that this patient has frontal bossing and hyperareation of the uh, uh, frontal sinus. Also, the cell appears to be likely enlarged, which may be related to a pituitary macroadenoma. Uh, there in the hand, we see this classic spade-shaped distal flanks uh, configuration. And the other important thing here is that the articulations appear to be widened. So this is a case of acromegaly, uh, likely uh, related to a pituitary macroadenoma secreting growth hormone in this adult patient, and you get to see this frontal bossing, hyperareation of the sinuses, enlarged cella, classic spate like distal phalanx of the hands, and widen articulation because the cartilage gets thickened. Another thing that you can get is thickening of the heels fat pad, so case of acromegaly uh, related to hypersecretion of growth hormone. So we have PA views of the hands, and in this case, what we see is that there is fluffy periosteal reaction or periostitis about the uh, diaphysis of the proximal phalanges of both hands. We see it on both hands. So here we go to the differential diagnosis of diffuse periosteal reaction. In this case, we're going to favor thyroid acropachy because, or acropachy because it is in the proximal phalanges of the hand, and that's a common location for that. But really, this is a case of differential diagnosis. And for periostitis, you have to include you know, you know, pulmonary hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, pachydermal periostitis, hypervitaminosis A. If it's in the mandible, people talk about caffes, uh, venous insufficiency. All those conditions can give you diffuse periosteal reaction. But always remember this one, especially if the patient uh, periosteal reaction in the phalanges, and especially if the patient has autoimmune thyroid disease. This is very commonly seen with Graves, not commonly, but of all the autoimmune thyroid disease uh, conditions, it's most commonly seen with Graves, but it can also be seen with hypothyroidism, and patients present with pain, and even when you do a thyroidectomy, this may not resolve. So yeah, remember the differential diagnosis for diffuse periosteal reaction.
So here we have a use of the hip and the femur, and we see that there is increased sclerosis throughout the left hemipelvis, the proximal uh, femur, the femoral head, uh, femoral neck, and the trochanters, and also there is this um, lines of sclerosis and distal femur. So uh, this has been described as a candle wax dripping configuration, and there is a case of meloriostosis. And it's one of those on many cases that you ha have either seen it before or not. Uh, there's really nothing else that looks quite like this, that this candle wax dripping. And uh, the things that you have to remember is that it usually happens in a dermatome configuration. Uh, so it's usually unilateral. And uh, yeah, just that buzzword, candle wax dripping appearance. Here we have sagittal and coronal images of the knee in uh, fluid sensitive fat suppressed images. And there is some effusion at the suprapatellar fat pad. And we see some subchondral edema at the weight bearing uh, lateral femoral condyle and posterior tibial plateau. And with this pattern of contusion, it's called kissing contusion, we can assume that there was some knee subluxation. When we got at the mid portion of the knee in the sagittal images, we don't see the ACL. The ACL is indistinct. And uh, we know that there is anterior tibial translation because we can see the fibulocollateral ligament in just one coronal image. So this is a case of ACL tear, which is acute because of the bone marrow edema. So sometimes you may see it very obvious, but in the test, they probably see, show you an ACL tear and some of the secondary findings that help you nail the diagnosis, like the kissing contusions uh, and evidence of um, anterior tibial translation. Here we have AP and lateral views of the knee, and we see that there is a loosened lesion within the proximal humeral metaphysis. We can see it in the AP and lateral view. And this lesion is well-defined, and the borders are sclerotic, but the sclerotic borders are not really thin, they're pretty thick. So this tells us that we have kind of an active but subacute lesion in the bone. On the axial T2 and sagittal T1 images, we see that there is a lesion within the bone that resembles an abscess because it has high T2 and low T1 signal intensity uh, within the lesion. Uh, so this is a broly abscess, which is subacute osteomyelitis. Things to remember about this is that uh, obviously it's osteomyelitis, which is usually hematogenous, mostly seen in young patients and pediatrics. And the four rings of MRI, which is the pus within the abscess, which is low T1, high T2. And then this linear high T1 signal intensity around the abscess. This is granulation tissue that enhances and is called the penumbra sign. And it's very, very specific for Brody sepsis. Then we have the third ring, this uh, sclerosis that we saw on the radiograph, and then the outermost ring, which is edema of the bone. Uh, things that you're going to see as it progresses, it creates a cloaca, which is a tunnel where this pus gets out of the body through the bone. Uh, and then you get a soft tissue abscess, and eventually that abscess will go to the outside world through a sinus tract. If you get a piece of bone within the abscess that is left behind, that is called a sequestrum. And if you start producing bone around, uh, periosteal reaction around the bone that is infected, that is called an involucrum. So Brody sepsis. Here we have AP and lateral abuse of the knee, and there is some degeneration, but what we see here is that there is some sclerosis at the subchondral bone, uh, both at the weight bearing aspect of the medial and lateral femoral condyle. So we're thinking that there is a vascular necrosis because it's right in the subchondral bone and it has that kind of serpiginous increased T2 signal intensity with central lucency. So in the MRI, we see this abnormality of the subchondral bone, uh, kind of the serpiginous uh, low T1 and low T2 signal intensity surrounded by high T2 signal intensity. Serpiginous is the key word here. And just to remember when a bone infarct extends into the subchondral plate, we call it a vascular necrosis or AVN. And when a bone infarct is not extending into the subchondral plate or articulation, and it's just in the medullary cavity, we just call it bone infarct. Uh, so if you see this in the femoral head, we call it AVM because it extends into the subchondral plate and it can progress into articular collapse and then degeneration, which is not the problem with medullary cavity uh, bone infarct. And this was a patient with sickle cell disease. So here we have AP and lateral views of the wrist and we see that there is collapse and increased sclerosis of the lunate. 
Uh, so this is a case with advanced Kimbuck disease, which is a vascular necrosis of the lunate as part of the osteochondrosis, meaning abnormalities of the cartilage and bone. And there are a lot of eponyms for the osteochondrosis. Some are due to uh, vascular infarcts and others to microtrauma and some others to a combination of both. Uh, but this one in the lunate is called Kimbuck's disease and remember is associated to ulnar negative variants. So we have here a AP view of the sacroiliac joints and we see that there are no sacroiliac joints, there are fused. And we also see that there is calcification of the interspinous ligaments and there appears to be fusion of the lower lumbar spine. So we're thinking that this patient has chronic sacroiliaris and with findings in the spine, we're definitely thinking about ankylosis spondylitis. Then the AP and lateral views of the lumbosacral spine confirm the diagnosis with the syndesmophyte, uh, which is calcification of the fibers around the uh, intervertebral disc and fusion of the facets. This is what we call a bamboo spine and is very classic for ankylosis spondylitis. Bilateral symmetric sacroiliaris, we see it in ankylosis spondylitis and um, negative uh, spondylar arthropathy related to IBD. Uh, bilateral and asymmetric, we see with the negative spondylar arthropathy, psoriasis, and reactive arthritis. In this AP view of the thoracic spine, we see some focal uh, scoliosis at the level of T9, and we see destruction of part of the vertebral body. So in this case, we kind of thought it was metastasis when we did a cross-sectional image. In the CT with sagittal reconstruction, we see that there is actual destruction of several levels in the thoracic spine. And most importantly, we see that there is an abscess or rim enhancing fluid collection at the anterior paraspinal spaces. And this is a case of POTS or tuberculous uh, infection of the intervertebral disc and end plate. This guy is osteomyelitis. And um, the important thing to remember about POTS is that it can affect multiple levels with having some of them uh, not affected. And we usually looking for that progression or extension of disease through the anterior paraspinal process. So this is a case of POTS tuberculosis. So here we have AP and lateral views of the knee, the distal femur. We see a loosened bubbly lesion uh, that is centering the epiphysis of the medial femoral condyle. And we see three findings that are characteristic of the cell tumor, which is an epiphyseal lesion expands out loosened lesion with well-defined non-sclerotic borders that is abutting the epiphysis, especially in a patient with a closed growth plate. This is a benign lesion that can metastasize and you do curettage and packing of these lesions, but they can recur in up to 40% of the cases. So we have to pay attention to follow up. Differential diagnosis for epiphyseal lesion will be chondroblastoma, but usually the growth plate will be open. It's more common in pediatric patients. Um, and then he has a well-defined uh, thick sclerotic borders. Also, obviously, tuberculosis infection, eosinophilic granuloma, and in the, in, in the adult, clear cell chondrosarcomas are, have been mentioned in the differential diagnosis of epiphyseal lesions. So we have a coronal oblique and sagittal oblique views of the shoulder in T2 fat suppressed images, and we see that there is a large cyst, a paralabral cyst, which is uh, insinuating in the suprascapular nerve tunnel. The proximal aspect of the tunnel is the suprascapular notch, the inferior aspect is the spinoglenoid notch. Uh, so in this case, we have edema of the infraspinatus only, and the suprascapular nerve innervates the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So if a paralabral cyst or any other mass impinges at the level of the suprascapular notch, then you'll have edema of the supra and infra. In the spinoglenoid notch, you'll have only of the infra, as in this case. There are other conditions that can cause denervation uh, in the quadrilateral space, but it will be of the axillary nerve and a brachial neuritis, which is Parsonage Turner syndrome. Three views of the hand, and we see clump calcifications about the joints of the wrist. And this is a patient with tumoral calcinosis, which is in differential diagnosis of soft tissue calcifications. Usually in young African-American patients, it usually happens around the articulations and goes into differential diagnosis of multiple or diffuse soft tissue calcifications. But because of the periarticular location and demographic of the patient will favor tumoral calcinosis, which is idiopathic. Axial, sagittal, and coronal T2 fat suppressed images of the elbow 
show that we have fluid around the distal biceps tendon and we can see here that the biceps tendon is retracted and it's not inserting at the radial tuberosity as we see here in the coronal image too. It's at the level of the Lacertus fibrosus which is uh, the place where this uh, biceps tendon when it's torn usually gets stuck. So there's a biceps tendon tear. Uh, in radiograph you see the Popeye's sign because uh, the bicep muscle gets retracted and it looks very big and it's called the Popeye sign and remember it usually gets stuck at the Lacertus fibrosis and you have to measure the retraction from the radial tuberosity and when you do an elbow MRI for biceps tendon tear you have to include proximally so you can see the amount of retraction so biceps tendon tear.